to Treyarch. I'm John Raffis, and this is the very first live stream for Call of Duty Black Ops 4, the first of many streams from this, our new live stream studio. So let's get right to it. On May 17th, we revealed Black Ops 4 to the world, and next week, we've got E3, where we will have four playable multiplayer maps on the show floor. We thought today would be a great opportunity to kind of talk about where we were at at Reveal, talk, speak to a few community questions that came out of Reveal, but also look ahead to what's in store for next week. And to do just that, I brought with me two guys who need no introduction, but we'll get one anyway, Dan Bunting and David Vonderhaar. Gentlemen, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Raffis. All right, let's, let's jump right into it. Next week, multiplayer maps on the show floor. Uh, let's start broad, sort of recap a little bit about Reveal. Dan, why don't you tell us about what people can expect from Black Ops multiplayer when they get their hands on it? Well, first of all, Black Ops 4 is a game that's been built um, from the ground up to be played online with friends. It's a game that uh, really reinforces your social connections, your social gameplay experiences. I think that that's what our fans and our community has come to know and love about Treyarch um, and the games that we make, uh, whether you're playing competitive multiplayer or cooperative zombies. Uh, it is a deeply engaging and continually rewarding experience. So, um, with competitive MP, I think you know we talked a lot about it. Uh, Vaughn, you're welcome to jump in any time. But we uh, we're going to make him jump in. Now. <laughs> Don't worry, he's jumping in real soon. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we talked about the game um, that it, we are bringing specials back in a kind of different way and a new twist. Uh, we talked about it being a very again is deeply rewarding. Um, with a big focus on overhauling our weapon systems, making those systems feel like they're more competitive, more satisfying to players. Um, they have a good learning, deep learning curve that um, players can master. But it's also got a more grounded, more tactical feel to it. That's right. We want to put, introduce that tactical layer so the players feel like they can compete together, that um, there's a whole new layer of depth to the game that, that they can um, play and, and just continue to master over a long period of time. So David, if that's you good, by the way. <laughs> so I'm not, I didn't even take a breath. My job is done. I don't have to dock anymore. I just go home. And no, I'm kicking it back over to you to talk oh. about game design decisions. Uh, so if you could talk about some, some of the the design principles at play that you guys have enforced for for Black Ops Four. Yeah. So I mean, always we start um, with what we call the game pillars, um, and they are sort of foundational things that guide a lot of the decision making for where the game is. So they're um, I use them, and my job is kind of a report card for the work that we're doing as a team. So uh, one of the big ones that's important to me uh, for the pillars was uh, rewarding in all things. I think that's a, a really simple way of saying everything that you do when you play the game, like if you press a button, it has the haptic feedback, it has to give you audio, right? it has to animate. Like sure. These are all really simple things in isolation, but together they create that kind of experience where subtly you know, doing something as simple as reloading your gun has a lot more to it than just everything that you know about reloading your gun, maybe historically, right? All, and that includes effects, animations, the model, uh, lighting. I mean, just across the spectrum. So that one's really important. The other one that we talked about a lot was uh, fun to watch, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ways to think about fun to watch. It's not just, hey, this supports streaming features, right? That's a thing um, that it's streamer friendly, but also the game design itself, right? So when Dan talks about the specialist in particular, there's an example of, as a spectator, while you're watching the game, uh, you understand a little bit more about what's happening there because you're watching a particular player play a particular specialist, and that particular specialist has things that, and does things that it, within the game loop that no other player can do. So that makes it sort of easier to understand when you're watching in a, in a way to associate how well you do playing that person than with the person who's actually streaming. So there's like two, and then the third one. Well, but all, that, all that feeds into the idea of like letting people still be sort of like a Call of Duty badass, but sort of unlocking a deeper potential. Yeah, like, of course. I like mean, you create work. a class and score streaks and selecting your weapon and configuring your weapon and the chat. I mean, all the things that make Call of Duty, Call of Duty are still here yeah. uh, in a big way. And our third pillar is uh, we wanted to have a deeply rewarding road to mastery where um, we want players to feel like they can pick it up easily, but um, that journey that they take from the beginning of playing the game all the way to you know, their infinite number of, of levels they might uh, earn through the game, uh, it feels like they are constantly learning new things, and that there's never, uh, there's never a, a nuance that they haven't picked up on over, over time. That we went, oh, sorry. Well, that's it. I mean, and we wanted the game to be learnable, so that was, you know, it's, it's a big kind of guiding principles. We want everything that you put into the game needs to be done in a way that's predictable so players can figure it out over time, they can learn how to do it, they can master it themselves. And manifest itself and say, like, the weapon design where every weapon, and, you know, we, we like to say it's its own unique snowflake, but it's its own, uh, really uh, modeled after the concept of a brand or modeled after the concept 
of a character itself. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's not just mastery of I unlocked all the attachments for this weapon, but I unlocked all the attachments for all of these weapons, and that path to that mastery is actually not exactly the same, right? So in a way, we took a lot of the stuff that we were really good at in the systems by putting nice things in nice clean boxes mm -hmm. that are easy to understand, and we sort of opened them up and cracked them open a little bit. So, th and this is a small example of road to mastery there. It's also specialist and how they combine together, right? So on day one, you might not even realize that if you have a character with a healing capacity of any sort, and then you combine that with a, you know, someone like Firebreak, what that does. So you'll see this sort of interweaving through the entirety of the game design, uh, and that, you know, that's been a quite a journey. And then <laughs> also like finds its way into more nuanced elements like predictive recoil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, that's that, that's a perfect reason. example of, of a, a, a kind of an overhauling a system that we've lived with in uh, our games and in the franchise for many, many, many years. That um, we we wanted to kind of challenge what assumptions this game is built on. Um, and then fill, you know fulfill that uh, that pillar that we have that you're going to have a, a game that's deeply rewarding and a game that has a long road to mastery. So um, you know predictive recoil is an example of just some, another layer of changing a core mechanic to give players something that they can learn over time that they can understand um, that gives them that that predictability that they can master over time. And at the same time, when you take predictive recoil and you combine it with the progression, the way that the guns progress, and you mix it with sort of how they all interplay and the long range, and then you get the combat loop that you can sort of, for us, it's really important to take a crack at what does the combat lo loop look like, where does it modify, at what stages does it modify. That's how you end up with something like the, uh, the need to self-heal, uh, you know, to start and initiate your own heal. So it's interesting because when you talk about features, it's like the simple way to talk about features is to say, we have a feature. That is that you have to initiate your own heal, right? And in isolation, that seems like, well, okay, well, you know, maybe that would be okay, right? But it's the totality of the experience of the features and how they all interweave together. And that's a very tough story to tell when you're on stage for, you know, 10 minutes uh, for, the, for the public reveal. But something that I'm personally excited about being able to come into the, the studio that you built, the house that John built, <laughs> uh, that's quite gorgeous. And, you know, we can maybe dig a lot deeper for folks who are no, curious about those no things. No time limits. David, no yeah. time limits. There's, there, there is some time limits. There is the fact where we have to finish the game, but, but sure, I, you know, I, I like that. So if you're, uh, if you want to kind of get into the weeds a little bit with us, this is the place to be, I think. Yeah, that's the beauty of doing a, a live stream like this is that you know we do have a very tight time window to be up on stage and explain everything about the game in a, in a compact five to ten minute session. But um, we, you know, we come here, we get to say, why do we make these decisions? Yeah. What are, the, what's the motivation behind it? Um, How do they all interconnect together, yeah. right? So it's a, you get the, maybe the better journey, or the, the more, sorry, the more detailed version of that journey and how they tie together. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's take that idea and apply that to something that you raised, which was the regenerative health. Uh, so coming out of Reveal, there were a couple questions around health regen. Uh, we put up a, a Reddit post that tried to outline some answers. There were still a couple follow-up questions that, that came out of that post. Perfect. This is yeah. exactly in my wheelhouse. So... First, I mean, let's just start broadly from like a, a design perspective. Like, what is the the player benefit? What's what's the player benefit for triggering, having to trigger health regeneration? Yeah. So there's so many ways to answer this question. I want, I'll, I'll, I'd like to try my version, and then you can maybe you know take sure. your perspective well, on this. So, so from my perspective, um, you have a, a, a fan base that extends Black Ops, Black Ops Two, Black Ops Three, uh, and all of those players. Some love one, two, three. Some love all three. Some love various combinations, right? And in, in some universe, you would want to Black Ops 4 to be a game that all of those players can really engage with. If mm -hmm. you loved 1, maybe we can get you to love 4, but not necessarily isolate a guy who loved 3. So throughout the Black Ops history, there was various degrees of lethality, right? So the first game was maybe um, a lot less lethal, or the time to kill was, a lot, was longer mm -hmm. than 3. Uh, so you get to kind of balance that out by saying, hey, tactical players, you know, you have to, they have a decision-making point within the combat experience that they have to initiate, right? So if the other guy's not thinking about health the way a tactical player might think about health, then that tactical player can, has a chance to compete against a high-skilled uh, guy, uh, you know, a guy with great gun skill, I might say. So it's really about tactical decision-making within the combat loop, which changes the pace of that loop, so it puts pauses in it, and really puts a player in control of that combat loop, as opposed to, the game says, you will now heal, right? And now we say, you will heal, you will decide when to heal. So uh, if, if you're a game designer, being able to kind of take 
the things out. Uh, you know, the game needs to do things. It needs to work. It needs to maintain the rules. But ultimately, um, giving player agency over yeah. things is a always been kind of a, 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 a step from Black Ops to two to three. We've been continuing to find ways throughout the history of our development with Black Ops. Right. Same thing with Creative Class. Right. Same thing with many features. How do you just let the player have control over what that experience is when you can and when it makes sense? That's a, that was a long-winded answer, I think. It was beautiful. It was poetic, David. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, another thing, thing to, to add to that is that it introduces a point of tension in the game in the combat loop. It, and that point of tension is something that I think just adds depth. And if you go back to our pillars, every decision that we make in, on the development team is guided by those pillars. So if we say, we want this game to be deeply rewarding, so give me a, uh, give me a road to mastery where I can learn, I can master a mechanic, and make it feel good and satisfying at every moment of that, of that journey. Um, then we look at every decision that we make and every uh, kind of system and feature that, that exists in the game, and something like heal is something that it, it, it kind of, it removes that decision point. It doesn't let you uh, kind of stop, pause, rethink, uh, reposition yourself in a, in, into a, in a combat engagement. Um, so the effect of having self-healing as a mechanic that's that's manual uh, is that the combat uh, people you see people staying in combat longer because they'll take damage, they'll pull back behind cover, they'll Which stay is behind the cover. That's part bit. of the experience. That's the funnest part of the experience. I mean, staying in those those really those um, those really high intensity battles is really the most satisfying part of our game, and so we want players to be in that experience more often. Well, there was also uh, kind of a follow-up question to all this. So it's like on, on one hand, there was like, you know, explain to me sort of how this all works, what's the benefit. But there's sort of the follow-up about, about stim and the use of the stim shot. Sure. Mm -hmm. So how exactly does that factor into, into health? So uh, in early development, when we start to bust out numbers or you, you know, the play of the game at Reveal or at E3, everyone should clearly understand that when you're at this stage of development, none of the specific tuning is completely locked in, right? So, so no one worry. Yeah, we're pre-alpha. Right. So, however, here's what STEM does. It does two major things. When you heal, there is a time period before you can heal again, right? So if I go out, take damage, heal, go back out, take damage again, now I have to wait. I can't heal immediately. Yeah. So STEM will shorten the time that it takes for you to be able to do that. It also speeds up how long it takes. So after you STEM, right, then how, much, how long it will take to get back to full health, right? So I've heard it all before. How is it going to be not a crutch uh, gear piece, right? Yeah. So the answer is tuning. The answer is data. The answer is player feedback, right? I've heard, I've, in this job you hear, you know, that in the abstract it seems like, well, you're going to have to have STEM. Well, you're also going to have to make super tough choices between STEM and other four things in the gear slot. So I'm not worried. You don't have to be worried. We, we, this, is a, this is what we do with you all, right? Exactly how we handle it. And the gear category is a new uh, introduction of content into the creative class this time around where we wanted to take um, some of those kind of modifiers that you have to your, your gameplay experience and take them up a little bit in the power band so that you get something that um, increases the granularity of your combat customization um, somewhere between perks and score streaks. Um, that's what gear does. And you get to choose one out of five uh, pieces of content in that category. So STEM is one. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I do want to just kind of echo what David was saying. It's pre-alpha. We do a lot of tuning between now uh, and game launch. We incorporate feedback from every time we put the game in players' hands, um, and and it doesn't stop there. Beyond launch, we are constantly tuning the game. I mean, you saw that with Black Ops Three. Um, we're still making changes to the game even recently. So some it's, that you love and some that you don't. <laughs> love. But all for the good, all for the good of the, of the community and the gameplay experience. And in this case, we've already tuned um stim shot based on the experience that people had at the reveal the reveal event so we were watching so now it's faster right <laughs> we were collecting data um it's funny because there was a lot of um you know it was a hot topic in the community people were talking about stim shot they were talking about armor a lot those are the two mm. kind of big ones um the data that we were collecting on the back end from all of the performance metrics showed that armor wasn't even that effective at, at helping people stay alive longer or get more kills or anything like that so um, Armor was actually one of the weaker uh, pieces of content in that category. Uh, stim shot was very powerful, and um, so was the motion sensor. Motion sensor was also uh, very powerful, well, so both of those have well, been tuned we, since we, then. We do need to nerf the motion sensor. <laughs> well, you, guys, uh, you guys have really gotten out in front of my next question, which is like, I mean, at reveal, uh, starting with reveal, I mean, the game has been in people's hands more and sooner than, than we've ever, we ever have before. Like, what have you taken away from that? What, what has... Though, what have those experiences kind of put your attention on from a, a design and development standpoint in terms of you know kind of what you're what you're evolving? Uh, it sounds like that process has already begun. Wow, well, uh, geez. So 
um, the, the way that we measure, uh, the way that we track performance, the analytics that are gathered and what to do with those analytics was a stuff that we spent a lot of time on trying to, and we started on two, really? And then on three, we had real tools, and then on four, the tool development about how to measure that. So, you know, it, you got it's it's hard, but you have to kind of you have to. For me personally, try to take the emotion out of you know the decision making that you make there, because people have very visceral reactions, right? So, um, you know, to be at a reveal event, which is a you know a semi-private event for the most part, and be able to gather and collect data about the game being played at reveal, that is like light years ahead of even where we were on three in so many ways. So yeah. normally you don't get that kind of data. Maybe you get it at alpha, you, some get a little bit of beta, and then you don't get the most of it until the game's out when you know, a billion people were playing, right? So it's nice to be able to have that kind of stuff up front. Some uh, mad shouts out to the guys inside the building that are helping us do that. All right, but we've done a whole tuning pass on all the weapons have been touched, um, all the pieces of gear content have been touched, score streaks have been tuned. Um, it was a good first run to get this in people's hands. Um, to start kind of testing the data that we're collecting with our own internal playtest data um, uh, and kind of judge also that Vaughn mentioned the emotional component, try to take the emotion out of it, but it is a data point as well. You've got your, yeah. your metrics, which you're, you're saying, how is this thing actually performing against um, the ways that we measure performance? Um, but then you have um, sentiment and you have uh, perception and you have emotion. There is a part of that that you have to take into consideration. Twitter. When There's you a lot of Twitter. To, there is. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> they have a voice, and, it's, uh, and it comes through loud and clear. Don't worry, Reddit. I got you. I got you. I have the loud and clear. I got you. Well, I, I, that's probably a pretty good point to start sort of turning our attention toward uh, E3 and looking ahead yes. to next week. Uh, to kind of kick off that discussion, Dan, you've got some news that you want to share with us today. Um, yes. Are we talking about the E3 maps first? <laughs> um, so... Yeah, one of the things that we are talking about at E3 is we are bringing back four fan favorite maps for Black Ops 4. Four fan favorites, Dan. <laughs> Tell us what they are. <laughs> I, I actually have them uh, queued up here. Uh, the first one that we're uh, talking about is Jungle. Uh, it's a map that was uh, that we've made in Black Ops 1. It has not been uh, revisited since Black Ops 1, but it's one of our favorite maps from development. Um, and we just feel like it did get enough love, and so we've we've remastered the jungle. Is that why? Yeah. Is that why you did that one? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's an awesome map, and it was. It's um, an awesome map. And we've not, you know not only completely rebuilt. You will like it. <laughs> and completely this, rebuilt the map. And this for, is a map that will be available when. This will be a map that's available at launch. Okay. It's, it comes with the game. It comes with the it's game. Part of the game experience, and uh, it's you know we each of these maps that I'm going to talk about we've rebuilt from the base level from the ground up. It's all new. Uh, visuals, all new. We've even done some gameplay tuning, um, some changes to adapt to the mechanics of the game as they've evolved from Black Ops 1 to now Black Ops 4. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first one, okay. Jungle. Slums. Slums is the second one. Good. You can talk, you want to talk about it? I just want to talk about how <laughs> awesome it is and uh, the nature, like the competitive nature of, of that kind of map, the, the, the walled garden in the, in the middle, right? These are all experiences that um, they're fun to come back to. It's actually really a good thing to to remind ourselves what we learned then, right? Because mm -hmm. when you go from one to three and things that had happened between those games, how fast two was and then the verticality of three, and then come back around again, right, on four to look at slums as, a, you know, as a pure great, like, you know, design roller test case. It's like, oh, this is why these maps were good. These were why these maps were popular. And when you get to four and you come back to the ground, right, you got to rem it's kind of, maybe slightly obscurely to say, it's actually important to remind ourselves that the pace of four is more in line with one, because you're not thrust jumping, and you're not wall running, right? Uh, so it's sort of like a really good way. So sums for me was like, oh yeah, this is the one, this is the one that I loved, right? And that's, yeah. that's good, because, you know, I loved slums. Well, and so, so did the community. Woods was happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. he's, he's nodding in agreement back there. Um, yeah, but that was you know that was one of our uh, our audience favorites from Black Ops Two, and they um, you know the community has asked for that one to come back many many times, and so this is, it's, it's a pleasure for us to bring it back. Uh, next up, we have Summit, which was another uh, classic from Black Ops One. Um, we joke because um, it was one of the first maps that we actually built for Black Ops One uh, multiplayer. Can, can we tell you the truth about this? The very <laughs> first map you make for any game, new game, it's actually the last map you finish. Mm -hmm. Summer, it's like. You, you're just like you're trying to get your mind around things and the, and the, and your, the level of self-criticism about the first map that you make and then somehow the second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever, you know, the, the, those maps are so much easier to get done. Uh, and Summit, you know, was a very popular map and as a map we liked, 
but it's also like the one map you were playing forever. Right? Well, perfection takes time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, wow. Summit was <laughs> Summit Some was one of our favorite maps. Yeah, <laughs> after a while, <laughs> right? Some of us have to work have to work on it. A lot. I get to do the fourth map. Okay. Firing range. Firing range. Um, is that a question or a statement? That's a statement. Nice. Fire, firing range is <laughs> exclamation the, mark. Firing range is the f <clears throat> is the fourth map uh, that will be available uh, immediately with um, you know Black Ops Four. Another kind of really good sort of anchoring map, right? I mean, Nuketown's a very popular map in our history for different reasons, but for, but firing range is a, is um, is like a, a classic sort of engagement sort of um, you know the first time we got really comfortable with the idea of parallel laning which is the concept that there's a structure and you can move through the structure in the same direction that you can also move uh, through on the outside of that uh, what what um, what the fans what the kids say wall banging you could wall bang in that map very well so that's uh, using bullet penetration feature to sort of shoot through a wall to hurt somebody on the other side of that wall so there's a lot of really good lessons there so um, I like these four maps because if you, you can use them as a uh, as a history lesson and a, a coaching and teaching tool uh, for you know the newer developers and map le level designers who have joined us over the years, um, and and they're, uh, they're they're good good case studies in so many ways. As a you know, and I, obviously I'm going to talking very from a designer perspective on those kinds of things. Oh well, wait, Dan, there's more. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> no. You were born for this. <laughs> no. Well, you didn't mention Nuketown. No, I didn't. <laughs> You did mention Nuketown. I did not. Um, we are bringing Nuketown back for our fans, um, and that's a it's a map that w has been a uh, you know it's it's a map that we've reimagined every game, and we've done something uh, completely different every game. Um, but with this one, we're kind of going back to the Cold War roots a little bit, um, and it is uh, but it's got a different twist. So okay. if you look at the very original Black Ops One, it was really built into that that sort of American ideal of, of Cold War era suburban families. Um, and we have recaptured that theme of the heart of Cold War, but we've put a different twist that we think is a lot of fun. Um, we can't wait to talk more about it. Um, and it is, a, it is a map that we're bringing to our fans shortly after launch, but everybody uh, who plays Black Ops 4 will get it. Uh, that map was designed by Adam Hoggett, a uh, level designer for MP, who recently celebrated literally his 10 year anniversary at Treyarch. Congratulations, Adam, also. If I have to talk to you about Newtown one more time, I'm just going to fall over. Uh, all right, so I, I ran into him in the parking lot yesterday, and I'm like, thanks, bud. Still talking about Newtown. <laughs> Got to talk about it tomorrow. So, look. I'm going to have to ask you to dial it back there a little bit, David. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, it's, fun to, it's fun for us to, to joke about, and, um, you know, it's, it's fun for us to do different things to it. Uh, some of which Dan's alluding at, and there's more to that still. So it is the perfect map for us to um, manipulate, to serve our will, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I, I, I still love Nuketown, and, and we know that the fans love Nuketown. Very cool. I want to keep the map discussion going. I want to turn our attention to the four maps that will be available on the show floor. First, I want to give a little shout out to uh, Zombies. Uh, as you may recall, uh, Jason and Craig uh, showed up at Reveal to share information about the Zombies offering for Black Ops 4. Biggest Zombies offering ever with three experiences on disc, nine Voyage of Despair, and a sweet coming-of-age tale, Blood of the Dead. Um, anyway, Jason and possibly some friends will be on hand Wednesday, June 13th at 1.45 at the Novo at LA Live to speak with the one and only Jeff Keeley about Zombies past, present, and some future. So... Make sure to tune in next Wednesday. Uh, keep an eye out on our social channels. We'll let you know uh, when to tune in for that. Uh, Jason and Craig could not be here with us today. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that immediately following the stream, there will be a little uh, message from Jason up on our blog post that will shed a little more light into where they're at and what they're up to. Uh, in the meantime, back to multiplayer. Guys, <laughs> sorry. I, I think I was like reincarnated from Ron Burgundy at some point. <laughs> All right, four maps, show floor. Uh, we got a lot to talk about here. We got some map fly-throughs, uh, a brand new map that people haven't seen yet, uh, which we will get to. Let's first start with Contraband. Contraband, yes. So Contraband <laughs> was uh, one of the maps that, that everyone saw at Reveal. Yep. Um, it is based on a tropical island off of the coast of Colombia. Uh, where a, an international arms smuggling ring is based. Um, and so it's a really exciting map. Um, it's a lot of fun. It has a very kind of jungly type of vibe, very ocean vibe. Um, this isn't spring break material. 
Yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is yeah, this is not a spring break okay. party. Uh, there might be pirates here. <laughs> oh God! There are no pirates. No pirates. No pirates. <laughs> so, just kidding. No pirates. Uh, but it is uh, you know contraband is was a really fun map to make. We really enjoyed capturing that kind of that old vi old world vibe mixed with um, you know this new world kind of contraband under uh, under the radar sort of smuggling ring uh, camped out here. So um, it's got a lot of underwater combat. Um, has really tight choke points on the bridge. This bridge is a, is a center, central hot spot, um, especially in domination, trying to capture the B point. Um, and that's kind of what this map is all about. Yeah. Uh, it also looks really good. <laughs> so pretty. Uh, and then next up, uh, I believe this is the new one, Frequency. Sure, we want to do the new one right away. All right, let's talk about Frequency. Let's just get into it. <laughs> uh, frequency is, uh, it's a very small chaotic map. Actually in development we called it, we were calling it Frenetic because it was, it's one of those maps that uh, you get a lot of fast paced action. It's got, um, it's got a really great flow to it, um, constantly moving players around um, and, and colliding them into really great intense head on battles. But Frequency is, um, it's based in uh, Hunan province. Uh, it is a very large, complex listening station that our spe specialists have uh, gone into assault. And um, it sort of has that a uh, little bit of that kind of uh, danger element to it where, if, if you remember even, you know, we talked about Summit, that was one of the first maps that we did where we, we added the risk of falling to your death, so you have to be careful in certain areas. Um, this is another one of those maps that you have to be a little bit more careful when you move around the outside uh, lateral paths. Um, but the inside is a super uh, tight choke point hotspot. Yeah, large. You say large. So the the complex is large. The map itself. The is, map is, is, is the map is tight. Yeah, this is a, yeah, frenetic. One of our smaller ones. Yeah, it's uh, intensely uh, chaotic in the center. Need mm -hmm. to talk to our production team. I, I hope I'm getting this right, but uh, I believe that I believe that this is the map that uh, will feature the the new mode control on. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about control and how the mode works? Yes, Control. So Control is a new uh, game mode uh, that we've introduced in this game. We've designed it um, with the goal from the beginning of really bringing out the best of the tactical gameplay that we have in this game and, and kind of enhancing the roles that the specials play in combat where uh, you can really, you know, your team is going to work together whether they mean to or not. And that was one of our goals in this game is that we wanted to introduce more teamwork without forcing it on players, let players um, kind of just play the game, mm -hmm. enjoy it. Uh, we've, we've talked about, we had this kind of philosophy of what's in it for me. Like, uh, I want to help my team, but I want to make sure that I'm doing awesome myself. So every, every single mechanic that we've designed is, is really designed to cater to our Call of Duty st style of player while also introducing teamwork, whether active or passive. And, and this mode is really um, built to bring that out. With um, a shared, you know, pool of lives, right? So it's, there's an example of how you can, what's in it for me? Well, I shouldn't die, but then by not dying, I also right, can help my team win. So those are how you get players shared goals, right, without forcing the shared goals, because it's bad for you to do that, it's bad for your team to do that, yeah. right, towards the end. So the, the way that this mode resolves it can be quite intense. Uh, there's nothing like uh, throwing yourselves on an objective at the same time you're trying to not die, right? So these are good, like, examples of uh, how you sort of can bring the teamwork out. Teamwork out. We're, we really talk about it in terms of bring the tactical play out of the game uh, and uh, it's you will help yourself by helping a teammate. That's the what's in it for me kind of thing, um, you know. But uh, that might also show you that Dan is maybe not a team player. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing hey, yourself on, me? on an objective what's without dying. <clears throat> yeah. Sounds like game development. That's what All I right. do. Wins. It's intense. It's a great mode. Everybody. Wins before I think our KD. Fans love it. Wins before KD. <laughs> All right, Seaside, uh, that is another map that we will have yep. on the Seaside show. Seaside is a uh, coastal kind of old world town uh, in the coastline of Spain that's been uh, built. It was the site of uh, a demonstration that kind of went awry. Government forces had to come in, so you see lots of big tanks have come in and barreled through walls. Um, this is uh, one of the maps, one of the first maps that we built on this game. Um, well, we are still playing it forever, <laughs> just like every game we make. But it's a lot of fun. I mean, this, this map has um, a big kind of open courtyard in the middle with um, sniper overwatch positions that Can are... Can you explain to me how the tank got in there? Because I'm still trying to figure that out. I, you'll never know. <laughs> it, it, it just busted through the wall and kept going. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that central courtyard is, is a site of some very intense battles. Um, it has great sniper positions up there, um, while at the same time having a lot of uh, tight, choky kind of flows around the outside. So if you want to take, for example, through the, take the path of the wine cellar, um, it's going to be kind of a windy path, lots of cover, lots of sort of um, kind of in and out positions that um, are fun to just fight close range combat with. 
I do appreciate that the pastries and wine were left untouched. Mm. So that that's priorities. Yeah, priorities yeah, are priorities. straight. Treyarch has a history of running uh, running tanks through uh, that particular structure. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, those types of structures. <laughs> Last but not least, payload. Payload. Payload is an ICBM facility, uh, a missile defense um, station that's built deep into the mountains mm. of Iceland. Nice. Yeah, that was going through the bullet hole thing. I think you're still <laughs> stealing the blackout stuff. Right there. Um, so you'll see these kind of like these large missile silos built into the mountain. Um, you're going to play in and around one. So that's kind of the hook of this map. You're playing um, through one of these missile silos around one of the one of the big missiles that's taken apart. Um, you can actually fight in and through it. Um, so it has some really kind of tight head-to-head -head spaces. Um, the way that the lanes connect up in this map are very different from how we traditionally do, mm -hmm. um, and that that leads to some new kind of. Uh, strategic opportunities for how you might attack the center. Um, that center spot, again, is a very uh, intense hot spot, um, but we also have some really tight paths that we've put, for example, some hard point objectives on that are really hard to hold down. And so, you know, we want to do these, uh, these kind of twists on the game modes to give players new experiences in how they capture and hold an objective, and this is no different. It's fun to see the maps again. Usually in early development, you know, I'll play these maps, but then uh, I'm on to the next set of maps while they, you know, they get arted up like this, right? So it's, uh, it's like, whoa, that's <laughs> awesome uh, to see some of the work that the, the hardworking men and women of Treyarch Art Department has done to make this thing look the way that it looked, right? So good job. All right. You've been busy with those guys, huh? Yeah. It's, they've put in a lot of hard work, and they are, they've turned out great. All right, we've got a couple announcements to to close things out before we get Is it there. Time to go. Any closing thoughts from you guys? Any any last last things to share? <laughs> Anything? Well, we can't wait to uh, bring the game to E3. Um, it's going to be on the show floor. Uh, multiplayer is playable for our fans um, in a couple of places. Yep. Um, so hopefully that can shorten some lines, and we'll have more on that very shortly. Absolutely. But if you're looking for what's playable at the Activision booth, you'll see us. It's in the South Hall, uh, number one thousand one. Uh, you'll get to play these four maps, Contraband, Frequency, Seaside, Payload. And uh, it's also worth noting that we will have uh, a number of PC stations set up and ready to go with multiplayer uh, at your disposal. Uh, it's probably also worth mentioning that uh, immediately after E3, um, there will be a couple of us at the DreamHack uh, event in Sweden. So keep an eye out for Jonathan Moses and our brand new community manager on the PC front, a guy named Rob Smith, will be wandering around the show. Um, and let's see here, what else we got? Um, following E3, following DreamHack, uh, Black Ops 4 will also be playable at the CWL Anaheim Open on the following weekend from June 15th through the 17th. Um, on the CWL front, immediately following the stream, you might want to check out the uh, COD Twitch channel for uh, all of the, uh, or for the schedule for all of the new CWL ma matches. Uh, and last but not least, I uh, wanted to throw out a few thank yous for today. Uh, we don't get to stream from a new stage without uh, a small army of people making it happen. Um, a couple people, Tommy Lira, Robert Sanchez, Lee Staples, a uh, little Scott Eckert action thrown in there. Josh Negrin, thank you very much for all of the help on the production front. Uh, Josh Torres, Rob Smith behind the scenes, Stephanie Glover, Jay Per, your art services team, and all, everyone at Activision for helping to bring all the assets to life. Fox Designs, Kim, Grace, Rocco, the uh, Treyarch's live ops and production team, and last but not least, Rose Villasenor. Uh, none of us would be sitting here if it weren't for her getting so much stuff done and making it happen. Thank you very much. And to everyone that tuned in today, thank you. Looking forward to see you at E3, and we will see you back here at Treyarch soon. Have a good one, everybody.